Intel fixes a few things and breaks some others. 300 terabyte SSDs are on their way and AMD delivered four times better performance from this one upgrade? What do you, why did nobody talk about this? Let's get into the hot news, everybody. I'm your Brett host. We're gonna be going over the hottest tech news that I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast. Now we're gonna start off today talking a lot about Intel because there's a lot of details coming out with regards to them, namely on their GPU side. It turns out that they fixed one of the biggest problems that was present at launch with these graphics cards and that is the power consumption that happens when you plug in more than one monitor. And the latest drivers, what we're seeing is a significant reduction in that total power consumption, going down from 40 watts to about nine watts when you plug in two displays. Currently, this power savings works only if you have up to two displays. If you're at three or four, it will not work for that. And this has to do with how the Arc A series GPUs enter low power idle states, and it just can't do it as effectively with multiple GPUs. Hopefully, Intel continues to fix it. But another graphics technology that Intel is going to be bringing to the table is a version of VSR, Virtual Super Resolution. We talked about this last week, how NVIDIA rolled out this feature in conjunction with Chrome, where it enables your PC to just upscale any video that you're seeing on the internet using your graphics card. And it turns out that there's some details where this is actually baked into Intel's graphics cards already, whether it's on the CPU in the integrated version or in a dedicated GPU, it's just not enabled on the system as of yet. But some people have been able to tinker around and get it enabled and just in the screenshots that they've provided, you can see a noticeable uplift in clarity with this VSR being turned on from Intel. Hopefully that gets delivered soon so that we don't have to buy 30 and 40 series GPUs and you could just use the integrated GPU that's in your 13400. That would be so much better. But we do have to issue a major correction to one of the things we talked about in Hot News last week. John Petty Research came out showing that AMD and Intel had the exact same market share for Q4 2022. Turns out that the math was wrong by John Petty Research search, and that is not true at all. AMD still has the upper hand over Intel when it comes to discrete graphic sales, and part of that is because of the way Intel batches their numbers and deliver data center numbers with their actual discrete GPUs, and when you combine those, it would look like Intel had 9% of the market, but it turns out that they effectively have 6% of the market when you're looking at gaming or just regular client compute, not data center compute. So AMD, not in as bad of position as you would think. Intel still stealing market share from AMD, but they are not on level playing fields as of yet, and they definitely will not be when it comes to the data center, because over the weekend, Intel put out a brand new roadmap for their high performance compute GPUs or everything that's supposed to go into the data center, and they're canceling a whole lot, shifting a few things over and making it just so that they're seeding ground over to AMD and Nvidia to be in the high end server sector. So they will not have an update to their data center GPUs until 2025, at which point they'll bring out the Falcon Shores XPU, which is supposed to be a hybrid fusion of a CPU and a GPU in a data center environment. But this doesn't bode well for Intel on the GPU side. I mean, even with what we were expecting them to come out with, they were not gonna compete with AMD or NVIDIA with AMD's MI Instinct GPUs or NVIDIA's H100 just wasn't gonna happen. We're also expecting NVIDIA to potentially make an update to that at GTC later this month. So they are very far behind in data center. I think they have a much, much better chance in client or for just regular gaming people. I still think the rumors that Intel is gonna shut down their gaming sector doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I could see them potentially pulling the plug on the data center with all of this information that's coming out, but I will never pull the plug on UFD deals, no matter how many times Reese doesn't show up. Yo, welcome back to UFD deals, bringing you the hottest tech deals out on the internet. Happy Monday, guys. Hope you have a good start to your week. We've got a good start to the deals with the next storage M.2 NVMe SSD with the heatsink. You can pick up the one terabyte version for $87.99, which is $62 off, 41% off, and a great pickup for your PS5. And then secondly, we have this Acer Aspire 5 laptop featuring a 15.6 inch 1080p IPS display, AMD Ryzen 5 5625U, 8 gigs of DDR4 and a 512 gig NVMe SSD, which you can pick up for $479.99, which is $170 off, 26% off and the lowest price in 30 days. But those are the deals. You can find these and more linked in the video description. But until next time, I'm gonna hand you off back to Brett for the rest of your hot news. Cheers. But here's a deal I can guarantee Reese did not put in UFD deals, whether it was there or not. You want savings on your graphics cards? Turns out that GTX 16 and RTX 30 series are gonna be getting a price cut later this month thanks to NVIDIA partners. And I want you to give me a little drum roll in your heart thinking of how much is it gonna be? How much will you save? 10 bucks. 
that is how much we are expecting to get a discount due to lower demand on these cards. NVIDIA very clearly doesn't care that you don't like spending $500 for a 3060. You're going to spend 490 round up. It's roughly the same amount. There you go. Watch out for those price drops later this month. But Meta also dropping the price on their gaming consoles. The MetaQuest Pro and the MetaQuest 2 getting price drops. The MetaQuest Pro is getting a $500 reduction to be down to 999. This thing launched very recently. So this is a very steep price drop from Meta on this. The MetaQuest 2 is dropping down to 429. This is after the initial $100 price bump that they brought on a few months ago. This is a $70 price drop, but a $30 price increase from where the headset used to be. It's not quite clear what Meta's strategy is here. I read an interesting article talking about how Meta doesn't realize that they are selling gaming consoles with these things. They're not selling a metaverse. They are selling a portal to video games or just like applications. It's not going to be the full-fledged metaverse reality that maybe Mark Zuckerberg is envisioning. What do you think? I want to hear from you about that down below in the comments. But in case you want to store all of your metaverse games, well, Pure Storage wants you to do it on their SSDs because they're anticipating by 2026, they're going to vastly outstrip hard drives and be at 300 terabytes on an NVMe drive. You can see here their roadmap for how much density or how much data they're going to be putting on a single drive. The blue line is regular hard drives, which has been beating out what you can get on an SSD. And they're expecting that pure DFM storage is going to just burst to 300 terabytes by 2026 with pure storage saying that the plan for us over the next couple of years is to take our hard drive competitive posture into a whole new space. Today, we're shipping 24 and 48 terabyte drives. You can expect a number of announcements from us at Accelerate Conference around larger and larger drive size with our state ambition here to have 300 terabyte drive capabilities by or before 2026. Now this, if they're shipping out 24 and 48 terabyte SSDs, that's already in league with some of the largest hard drives that are out there, especially with companies like Toshiba saying that by 2026, they should have 40 terabyte hard drives and a company like Seagate saying that they should have about 50 terabyte hard drives at that time point and 100 terabyte hard drives by 2030. SSDs look like they're going to be the way to go. Obviously, this doesn't mean that it's going to make it into your gaming system by 2026, maybe 2030. If you look up how much 24 terabyte and 48 terabyte SSDs cost, they're not reasonable. It's not going to be accessible for the everyman, but it's good to see that the technology is progressing and you can install so many versions of COD on this SSD. Or Doom Eternal if you want, which is now getting a ray tracing update on the Steam Deck of all things. In the latest beta that's coming out to the Steam Deck, they are enabling ray tracing on Doom Eternal. It turns out they're finally allowing the RDNA 2 GPU that's on the Steam Deck to stretch its legs. And at least here's a still image of ray tracing being enabled on Doom Eternal. It's not heavy ray tracing. Tracing. Not everything is set up to be fully reflected and shadows and everything. It's, it's a little ray tracing in the corner reports. It's about 35 FPS, which isn't terrible. Probably not as fast paced as you want Doom Eternal to go. But with reports that DXR is also in the pipeline for other video games, just not quite ready yet to come out to the Steam Deck sometime soon. But NVIDIA's RTX technology where they ray trace or DLSS things, according to their official numbers, is roughly 400 different applications and games currently sitting at 300. So it does look like ray tracing is taking over the world. And if you want to know how ray tracing would work on an older system that has, you know, fewer PCI Express lanes, Tech Power Up has the greatest article for you because they went through and they detailed how does PCI Express scaling work on a 13900K with an RTX 4090. So essentially taking one of the fastest systems you can have and then trying to break it by making it so it has less data signal throughput. And what they found is that really on any modern system, you're going to be more than all right. So showing here at the current PCI Express 4.0 speeds, because NVIDIA did not give us a PCI Express 5.0 SSD, you're at 100% performance. If you're on PCI Express 3.0 at full speed or half of 4.0, you're at 98% of full speed. If you go down to PCI Express 2.0 or a by four lane on 4.0 or by eight on 3.0, you only lose 6%. It's only when you drop down to PCI Express 1.0 that you see any sort of significant performance loss, getting you down to 79% of what the 4090 and 13900K are capable of. That still beats out the 3090. You lose to the 3090. 
3090 Ti and the 4070 Ti, but that's still really good. PCI Express doesn't really need to be on 5.0 at the moment, but it does show that there is some performance loss, but it doesn't look like you need to worry too much if you're trying to install a secondary card that might drop you down to eight lanes or anything like that. You're likely gonna be very close to how fast the GPU can perform. But the new X3D chips from AMD don't look like they're gonna be performing well on Linux at the current moment because with the launch of these X3D chips, in order to get them working properly on Windows, there's a whole bunch of crap that you need to do. Microsoft had to work beyond the scenes in order to make it happen, but none of that exists on Linux. You don't have a Microsoft game bar, none of the special sauce that Microsoft and AMD have said that you need to enable. So after delving through benchmarks, Pharonix came out and essentially showed that the 7950X3D is about as fast as the 7700X in gaming on Linux at the moment, which is about where it is on Windows when you don't have all of the optimizations in place. So unless Linux updates to have a new AMD scheduler in order to make it work so that it does take advantage of the 3D vCache cores, likely the 7800X3D is gonna be the one that you wanna go to on Linux. But speaking of the X3D chips, let's talk about the big deal. The elephant in the room reports came out. The X3D chips, the big whammy that AMD didn't talk about was that when you pair it with the integrated GPU on the 7950X3D, you get three to four times faster gaming performance on the integrated GPU, taking things from unplayable to super playable. This was a report that came out from PC Gamer where they tested in a variety of games and found that yes, despite the fact that AMD changed nothing about the integrated GPU on the 7950X3D, their benchmarks went from six FPS in Tomb Raider to 26 in Bioshock Infinite, went from 13 all the way up to 45 in Total War Three Kingdoms. It went from nine FPS all the way to 34 and in F1, it went from 19 all the way up to a super playable 62 FPS, which is absolutely incredible. But you have to have that nagging thought in the back of your head of like, why didn't AMD mention this? What the heck is going on? How is there that much performance increase from 3D vCache when number one, the GPU, super slow, not really capable of tons of gaming. How are we seeing this much performance unlock? Well, it's time to get into, uh, likely their testing methodology is flawed because Tom's Hardware came out with a follow-up showing that at least in their testing of video games, they're exactly the same. So unless something got switched around with how Tom's Hardware did it, maybe they didn't enable the game bar, or how PC Gamer did it, where they accidentally turned on super overclock boost mode or had a dedicated GPU that they weren't aware of. Tom's Hardware's report on this makes a lot more sense, at least just logistically in my mind, the 7950X3D being within either negative 1% or 1% of other video games from the 7950X based on the integrated GPU. And part of this is because of the 3D vCache that the 7950X has is not connected to the integrated GPU. The integrated GPU is not touching that at all. So the fact that it's there is really only a CPU acceleration, not a graphics acceleration. We shouldn't see that much performance being unlocked. Maybe there's gonna be more details coming out where some people are getting iGPUs on the 7950X3D that are just crazy performers and AMD is just not disclosing it because it's a weird production mishmash or the likelier scenario is that they just mess something up in their testing and that the iGPU is exactly the same. I wouldn't rush out to buy a 7950X3D to just get better gaming performance on the integrated chip. Let me know if you would do that though. Does 62 FPS and F1 get you going enough to spend $700 on that CPU? Let me know down below in the comments and I'm gonna let you know that this episode's over. I'll be back here with more of the hottest tech news for you tomorrow, my friends.